Have you ever wanted to calculate exactly how much you float versus sink in water? Yeah, me neither, but we're going to need to do it for the MCAT. So this video is all about Archimedes principles, specific gravity, and how we'll use those concepts on MCAT style questions. Let's get started. Okay, let's do our basic terms and definitions. When we're describing something floating or sinking in water, we're using the principle of hydrostatics, which is in the physics world, and specifically about water or fluid that's not moving and how it acts on objects or its surroundings. In these practice problems, we're usually at what's called dynamic equilibrium, where we have no net force acting on an object, but we have a combination of forces that we can use to determine, again, if that object is going to sink or float or somewhere in between. The two forces that we'll be paying attention to in this video are gravitational force of the object in the fluid, which is calculated as F equals mg, where F is the gravitational force, m is the mass of the object in kilograms, and g refers to gravity, which on the MCAT we can round to 10 meters per second squared. This is one of the few constants that we'll need to know for test day that they may not provide to you. The second force we care about is the buoyant force, which is the force of the fluid acting on the object. I like to think of fluids as kind of greedy. They like to take up as much space as possible, and they do not like it when something else takes up what they consider their space. So when an object is immersed in a fluid, the fluid's gonna push back against it and be like, hey, get out of my space. And it does this with the buoyant force. The calculation for the buoyant force is force is equal to the density of the fluid, the volume of the fluid that was displaced by the object, multiplied by gravity. So we're able to use these two forces, the gravitational force of the object and the buoyant force of the fluid to determine if that object is going to sink or float in that given fluid. In these setups, these forces are opposing each other. The gravitational force is pulling down where the buoyant force is usually pushing up. And so that means that we can subtract these forces. They're going to oppose each other rather than add together. And thinking through that equation, we can see which one will win based on their values. If the gravitational force is bigger, it's going to outcompete the buoyant force and the object will sink. Whereas if the buoyant force is significantly bigger, it's going to outcompete that gravitational force and push the object up and out of the fluid. If they're similar, that's where we get to the partially submerged, where the object can be somewhat submerged in the fluid because they're the buoyant force and the gravitational force are very close together in terms of magnitude. One final reminder before we dive into our practice problem is the concept of density, which is incredibly important in fluids and hydrostatics. Density is calculated by the mass over volume. So it's not just the mass of the object or the fluid, it's also how much space it takes up, the volume it takes up. So when we're referring to density, we have to remember the equation for density is mass over volume for that given object or fluid. All right, let's go ahead and dive into our first practice question. Okay, go ahead and pause this video to read through this question and try it on your own, and then we'll come back and work through it together. All right, a little complicated, right? Because we have a ball, uh, density, it's usually denoted as rho here, um, is 800 kilograms over meters cubed, is placed in a tank of water, density of water is provided as 1,000 kilograms over meters cubed, ignoring atmospheric pressure, this is one of those things that we assume when we're doing hydrostatic equations. What percentage of the ball is above the surface of the water when it stops moving? Now you might be like, Amanda, where are all my variables? Where is my volume of the fluid displaced? Where, you know, where is my mass? So we're going to have to break down this question conceptually before we can do the math. So let's start off by visualizing the scene. Okay, so we have the situation here. We have our tank, we have our ball, and we're kind of trying to see like, where is this ball? Is it floating? Right, that would be 100% um, of it above the surface, that would be answer A. Is it fully submerged? That would be D, 0%, or is it somewhere in between B or C? So let's start by identifying where our buoyant force and gravitational forces are and how we can rearrange those equations. So we know that our buoyant force is pointing up. And again, that force here, I'll write off to the side, is the multiplication of the density of the fluid times the volume of the fluid displaced times gravity, right? And then we have our gravitational force of the ball, which is again pointing downwards, and that gravitational force is the mass of the ball times gravity. So we know that when we're looking for a net force, we can say the net force is going to be the subtraction of the gravitational force minus the buoyant force, right? Because when we have two vectors in opposite directions, they're going to subtract. 
We also know that the ball is not moving, which means our net force has a zero acceleration. And if it has a zero acceleration, the net force is also going to be zero. So we can rearrange this equation to say that the gravitational force is equal to the buoyant force. And this is, by the way, in general, what we can do anytime we're at this dynamic equilibrium is instead of subtracting the two forces, we can set them equal to each other because the net force is going to equal zero. But this still doesn't really help us because we're missing some key pieces of information, right? We have the density of the object, but we don't have the mass. And we have the density of the fluid, but we don't have the volume of the fluid displaced. So here's a cool rearrangement that once you have this down, you can just memorize, but I want to talk through the concept of. OK, so we have these two equations set equal to each other, but we still don't have all the variables we need. And we're also looking for a ratio, really. We're looking for a percent submerged. So one of the things we can do when we determine the percent submerged, or basically how much one of these forces is going to win over the other, is we can set them up as a ratio. So our percent submerged can be equal to the gravitational force over the buoyant force. Now, this is calculating the percent submerged because the gravitational force is on top. This is typically how we set this up. Um, so I recommend just sticking with a standard procedure where gravitational force is always on top. If you wanted to calculate the percent above the surface or percent floating, you would put the buoyant force on top. Um, I would just say for the sake of keeping things consistent in your notes, it's general best practice to put the gravitational force on the numerator and calculate percent submerged first. And then we can always subtract from 100% to find the percent above the surface. All right, so that's what we're going to do. So now we can substitute in these equations. We have m of the ball times g over density of the fluid times volume of the fluid over g. Now, gravity is going to be the same for both, so it's going to cancel. This is also true. When we're at equilibrium, gravity doesn't matter because it's on both sides of the equation. We can cancel them out. So now we have the mass of the ball over the density of the ball times the fluid of the ball. So the funny thing about this is remember our equation for density. Density is equal to mass over volume. So if you want to isolate mass, you multiply both sides by volume. So another way of writing this equation is to say the mass of the ball over the mass of the fluid equals the percent submerged. And this is because, again, density times volume is equal to mass, right? Based on our rearrangement of our density equation. So now we can say, hey, the masses, the ratio of the masses will also tell us the percent submerge. So we have the ratio of the forces will tell us percent submerge, the ratio of the masses will tell us percent submerge, and the ratio of the densities will also tell us percent submerged. And this is because the volume of the fluid that's displaced, right, is going to be equal to the volume of the ball that's submerged. So we can, again, using our density equation, substitute in the same volume measurement. Now, if that's a little complicated, totally understand. It took me a couple proofs to go through and prove to myself that the math worked out. If you just want to trust me on this, you absolutely can. That if we want to calculate the percent of an object submerged, we can use the ratio of the forces the ratio of the masses, or the ratio of the densities. They'll all tell us the same thing, which is the percent submerged. And in fact, the ratio of the densities, especially if that uh, fluid is water, is equal to specific gravity. So we call specific gravity just this ratio that we're referring to. And again, if our object is more dense, has a greater gravitational force, has a bigger mass, it's going to sink more, right? If our ratio is basically greater than one. If our ratio is less than one, that means our buoyant force one, right? And it will float. So this is the specific gravity. Specific gravity is a unitless term that just refers to this ratio that we're describing here. All right, so now let's go ahead and do this math. So we have our, we'll go ahead and use our density since that's what we have. We have 800 kilograms over meters cubed over 1,000 kilograms over meters cubed. We cancel out the zeros. Uh, that gives us 8 over 10, or 80%. And remember, this is 80% submerged, right? So what are we asked about? The percentage of the ball that's above the surface. So if the ball is 80% submerged, that means 20% is above the surface, right, to equal 100%. So our answer here is C. 
So again, making sure that you know what you're calculating. As a general convention, put the object values on the numerator and you're gonna calculate percent submerged. And then if you're asked about the percentage above the surface, you just subtract from 100%. All right, so that was how to calculate percent submerged for a ball, but what about a person? It gets a little bit more complicated and that's the question we're gonna do next. Before we get there, I'm Amanda Bram and I've been coaching pre-med students on their MCAT journey since 2019. Please remember to subscribe to this channel for more videos on MCAT content, test taking strategies, and mental fitness tips to help you perform your best on test day. And if you'd like more interactive lessons on topics such as this one, including test day strategies and personalized study planning tips, go ahead into the caption below where you'll find a link that will take you to our next available MCAT course. Okay, go ahead and pause this video, read through the question, try it on your own, and then we'll work through it together. Okay, if this is a little tricky for you, that is totally normal. A lot of times I see this with students where we understand the equations, we may even be able to do some basic manipulations, but when they provide us with a new situation in the question stem that doesn't give us the variables we're used to, suddenly it's really hard to figure out how to set up the equations properly. So again, my recommendation is to write out what you have and then use some critical reasoning skills to find what you need to solve for the answer that's being asked in the question stem. Let me show you what I mean by walking through this question step by step. So we have a person weighing 60 kilograms in air and then 10 kilograms when submerged in water. And then we were given the density of water as 1000 grams per liter. What is the volume of displaced water in liters? So when I get a question like this, I'll often convert mass to newtons uh, using gravity, just because again, normally we're working with newtons. So a person weighing 60 kilograms in air, I just write that out as 600 newtons, right? 60 kilograms times 10 for gravity. That's going to be RFG, right? Gravitational force in the air. But then we have 10 kilograms when submerged in water. So we have 100 newtons, again, multiplied by 10. So this is our FG in water right? Which is a little different. This is our, again, still pulling downwards, but now it's only a hundred newtons. So it looks like we've lost 50 kilograms when we've gone in fully submerged into water. Then they're asking us, what's the volume of the water displaced? Now we know from our equations that that equation would be probably the buoyant force, right? Because our buoyant force, again, is Fb equals density of the fluid, volume of the fluid displaced times gravity. So this is the variable we need. Now we have density, right? That's given here. And we have gravity, that's a constant, but we can't have two variables missing, right? So what we need to find is the buoyant force and that will allow us to calculate the volume of the fluid displaced. But the issue here is we weren't given buoyant force, right? We weren't giving an upward pushing variable of this is how much the fluid is pushing on this person. We got, hey, here's how much the person apparently lost in gravitational force when they were submerged in water. So if we think about that setup for a second, and I'll go ahead and sketch it out here, right? So we suffered a loss of 100 newtons, which means we had to have subtracted some force, right? And we know from our first setup that force is probably the buoyant force, right? Because it's going to push up against the gravity and it's going to make the person appear lighter. So it needs to be pushing up and it needs to be pushing up the same amount of weight that we apparently lost. So what do we need to do? We just need to subtract the weight in the air minus the weight of the person in the water, which is gonna give us 500 Newtons. And that's gonna be our buoyant force because that's how much the buoyant force took away from the gravitational force when this person was submerged in water, all right? So is there an equation for that? Not necessarily, but it makes sense from an application standpoint that if we had this loss of weight, it had to have been lost somewhere, right? And our other force that we care about in the world of hydrostatics is the buoyant force, all right? So this subtraction is the key. It wasn't 100 Newtons. It was the difference between the two downward forces between air and water. All right, so now we have our buoyant force. All right, so math isn't so bad here. There's just one additional key point that you just gotta look out for. We are given our weight in kilograms, right? We did our multiplication for Newtons in kilograms, but our density was in grams. And if we're gonna solve for this equation, we've gotta have the same units. So I'm quickly gonna convert 1,000 grams per liter is gonna be one kilogram per liter, right? Because 1,000 grams equals one kilogram. So I'm gonna use one kilogram per liter here just to make sure my units cancel out. Let's go ahead and rearrange the equation. So buoyant force over density 
times gravity times gravity equals the volume of the fluid displaced, which is again what we're looking for. And then we have liters here, so we're not going to need to do any conversion to liters, which is great. So let's go ahead and plug in 500 newtons, right? And 500 newtons is kilograms times meters per second squared, right? Because of gravity mass over one kilogram per liter times 10 meters per second squared. The meters per second squared will cancel, the kilograms will cancel. We're dividing by dividing for liters, so that's going to pop back up on top, which is great. 500 divided by 1 times 10 is going to be divided by 10. 0 out, 0 out, 50. And that's our answer. All right, I hope that was helpful for you. Again, a lot of these hydrostatics Archimedes principle questions do require us to be a little flexible with our equations and the information provided. So try not to panic. Go ahead and start by setting it up, sketching out the relationship, and remember that the buoyant force and gravitational force are always going to oppose each other so we can use some creative math to find our answers that are asked in the question stem. Great work in this video. Please let me know how you did on these questions in the comments below. And of course, if you found this video helpful, please share it with your pre-med community so we can all support each other as we reach our pre-med and medical school goals. Thanks so much. Happy studying, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.